This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, Anna, for that introduction. And yeah, I'm excited to share my work with everybody on the genetics genome editing of fibroblast susceptibility genes as a robust strategy to develop and improve apple cultivars. So I naturally I'd like to start with the background of my disease. I work on fire blight. Um, it's caused by the pathogen Erwinia and my labra. It's a gram negative necrotrophic bacteria it causes hundreds of millions of dollars of damage in the US alone. Um, and it's been a problem for hundreds of years. Um, and given it's a necrotrophic bacteria, its main directive is to kill as much host tissue as possible to feed off the the uh, dead material and, and subsist off of that. It does this in two ways. So uh, uses a exopolysaccharide and malabrin to uh, constrict vascular tissue and um, restrict any kind of water or nutrition to that area of the plant that's getting um, infected. And more to the purview of my research, the other method is through a direct injection of bacterial effector proteins via the type three secretion system, which acts like a, um, a molecular syringe that will inject these effectors that have um, a multitude of functions in, related towards um, blocking immune signaling as well as uh, avoiding host detection. You can see some of the common symptoms on the, in the image on the right. Uh, we have the shepherd's crook, which is a bending wilting of the apical meristem, as well as some black necrotic tissue, bacterial ooze, which is an exudation of that exopolysaccharide. Uh, so given that most of the susceptible, uh, the Cultivars used in production today are susceptible to fire blight, all the fresh market apples you get in the grocery store. Resistance breeding is in high demand, but with tree breeding that comes with uh, quite a bit of challenges as well. So um, to intergress resistances from wild species, it can take up to 15 to 25 years. And that's mainly due to high heterozygosity from being an outcrosser and um, linkage drag and trying to recover fruit quality and multiply all that by four to five year juvenile cycle per um, per round of, of uh, crossing, if you were trying to do um, multiple iterations of a, a back crossing scheme to a recurrent parent, um, that can take quite a long time. It's infeasible for a lot of um, a lot of breeders that just focus on, on fruit quality primarily. And on top of that, you have incompatibility where Malus domestica um, can only really cross with uh, the three main uh, progenitor species uh, as opposed to the 50 or 60 other species that exist. Um, and you know, when we're breeding for resistance, we're looking primarily at these MBS LLR genes um, that are strong triggers and detectors of, of the pathogen, as well as elucidators of um, a strong effector triggered immunity and host defense pathways. So the most characterized one we have is uh, MR5 that comes from Malus robusta, and it's a coil coil MBSL uh, as MBS LLR gene. Uh, and with that, is is already found to have strains that overcome that resistance. So. Even if you were to accomplish that goal of breeding resistance into an elite cultivar, uh, with that comes an added selection pressure to accelerate the pathogen adaptation and um, ultimately go through this boom and bust cycle where you can have multiple years of strong resistance and then a breakdown uh, in a volatile next couple of years. And this is where I think uh, susceptibility genes as a breeding target can really fill in some of those gaps. So we classify it more as a recessive resistance given it's, it's described better as a um, loss of function mutation. Uh, and we can classify this in certain ways. It's a very broad uh, set of terms and, and set of targets. So anything that allows for pathogen compatibility or facilitating host systems going from a host to a non-host um, or encoding negative regulators of immune signaling uh, that pathogen can leverage and turn off immune signaling um, and any of those regulatory elements as well as a sustained compatibility. This could be over multiple years of disease infection where the plant could have um, a certain structure or, or target that fulfills metabolic or structural needs like a sugar transporter that is uh, hijacked by the pathogen and left in an active conformation. So two quick examples from literature and in other crops is CSL LOV1, which is uh, done in grapefruit but conserved in citrus. Um, it's a lateral organ boundaries domain transcription factor um, that is targeted by Xanthomonas citri, which is a bacterial disease. And what they found is the knockout of this gene uh, reduced susceptibility with minimal fitness costs, which is one of the biggest criticisms of susceptibility genes. Um, and with OSV, which was found in rice um, and knocked out, 
uh, kind of my example earlier, you have the sugar transporter that is uh, targeted by Xanthomonas species from these transcription activator-like effectors. And with the knockout of this gene, again, you have reduced susceptibility um, and they found no, no fitness cost um, statistically. So looking at uh, my specific genes in, in Apple, they're more disease specific. So you have HRPN interacting protein of malice, um, and you have DSP A slash E interacting protein of malice, hypum and dipum. Both are transmembrane proteins and both interact with um, their own respective Erwinia um, effector proteins. And th the main goal of the, the effector proteins is to try to stop any kind of immune signaling. Uh, well, the main purpose of these transmembrane proteins is to try to um, capture any signals, um, early signals of extracellular uh, molecular patterns of Erwinia um, to try to elucidate out an, an early defense response. Uh, well, the effector protein tries to, tries to block that and inhibit any kind of downstream pathways. So uh, this is, since these genes are conserved across malice, uh, we're interested to see what the genetic variation is across a diverse set of genotypes. So across 93 uh, genotypes in the germplasm, uh, inoculated them all with fire blight in the greenhouse and measured their, um, their uh, lesion length in the shoot and in the leaf and across the total distance. Um, and then generated amplicon sequencing data for each of the eight genes and with the alignments identified to 87 total SNP variants um, and performed marker trait association, uh, just straightforward Kruskal Wallace age test for each of the SNPs. Uh, you can see on the Manhattan plot on the left, there's uh, a few, there's 30 totally unique SNPs that had significant effect on the trait, um, but two that we highlighted in Dipum 2B that was found in 2018, 2019, um, as well as in multiple tissue types and, and multiple traits and Dipum 4B, which was found in uh, higher significance for three traits. Um, and you can see across multiple years, uh, there's a significant difference in the phenotype based on the SNP class. Uh, I'm also interested to see uh, if there's an additive response to having um, a combination of the lower susceptibility SNPs and the higher susceptibility SNPs. You can see the first two columns here um, in the box plot. Uh, this is a combination of a genotype that has both reduced susceptibility SNPs and both increased susceptibility SNPs, showing the most extreme classes with intermediate responses for the mixture, um, the mixture of the two classes. We also looked at the distribution of these SNPs across um, the different species, uh, wild and domesticated, that we use in the study with the, you know, Basic conclusions coming out as the vast majority of Malus domestica sessions had increased susceptibility SNPs with a few notable interesting exception, uh, exceptions, uh, some interesting cultivars. And uh, the wild had a mixture of both susceptible and um, increased and decreased susceptibility that were likely masked by um, resistances that already exist within those genotypes. So even if we're to make really specific markers uh, out of that data, it still comes with a lot of issues that tree breeding brings. So genome editing is a really promising technique um, to knock out susceptibility genes and uh, produce uh, really nice pre breeding lines or elite cultivars with heritable mutations. Um, so you can do this via biological vector with agrobacterium and have introgression of tDNA into the genome uh, and perform the double strand break, non-homologous end joining, and get that early stop code and that knocks out the gene. But what this ends up happening is you have a um, uh, regulation, you have a, uh, a certain level of regulation that you have to follow and segregating out that vector backbone is, is not uh, feasible in tree crops given the long juvenile cycle. So what I'm working on is a DNA free technique um, using biolistic bombardment uh, or protoplasts, where you integrate pre and stable uh, sgRNAs and Cas9, perform the same task, but in a DNA free manner, um, which is lower on the regulations, and you still get heritable mutation in a leak hole bar while skipping at least one reproductive cycle. And this is just some of my work here. I'm targeting Dipum 4A, Hypum 1B, 
in the genotypes um, Gell and Honeycrisp via bombardment and agrobacterium with an interest in typing 2B, which was from uh, the previous work I presented. And uh, just some validation uh, from previous literature, you can see a knockdown of hypon one b uh, and see the wild type here of galaxy, the cultivar galaxy is very susceptible. Um, and the transgenic explants are have quite a bit of produced susceptibility. And uh, more recently, you have a CRISPR knockout, full knockout of dipum 4 a in Gala and Golden Delicious, where you have a susceptible response for both. And then the transgenic plants have reduced susceptibility and significant upper growth, which is a good sign. So part of my, the interest of my work is to do this in a DNA-free manner, um, test this in different genetic backgrounds uh, with, um, uh, against a, a diversity of different strains of bacteria and to, to really test the robustness, um, possibly with even with double mutants of these genes to see if there's an additivity that holds up um, similar to the data I presented earlier. So with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Vase Khan, um, some of our lab members, Jagpreet, Giuliani, and Della, as well as my funding from ARDP and some of the collaborators on the genetic variation project, um, Mikhail Molnoy, Diego Micheletti, and Dr. Valerio Pompili. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions with any time I have left. Thank you for the wonderful talk, Vicky. That's really good. Um, yeah, you just, you were perfect in time. So we have five minutes for discussion. Awesome. And I am monitoring the chat for you. Yeah, I can see the chat, so. Okay. Um, yeah, let me read the question out loud. Um, so there's one question from Ed. He's saying, cool and editing process. How did you control for population structure in the associ associations? Yeah, so um, we tested for, uh, we ran a PCA and noticed uh, uh, there wasn't too much population structure. Uh, and when utilizing that in the model, given it's a small data set, there seemed to be some uh, overfitting of the model. So, uh, these were just kind of straightforward um, Kruska Wallace marker, uh, marker trait associations. Um, can I go ahead? <clears throat> this is Jean Luc. Um, so, you, you talked about these uh, susceptibility genes that when you knock them out, they <clears throat> gain resistance without any detrimental side effect. But, mm -hmm. like, why would, a, why would a, a species or a plant want to keep those around? And I mean, I think it's totally possible. Maybe they come through, you know, they, they are generally deleterious and, you know, drift can bring deleterious genes to fixation and so on. But otherwise, say there was some beneficial effect that you just haven't noticed, what would what would your lead hypotheses be on the, the, the value value of these of these alleles? Yeah, so the contribution of, of keeping the susceptibility alleles within plan is, is actually really vital given that a lot of them are associated with certain basic plant functions. So um, in the case of the sugar transporter, that's that's something that uh, the plant, you know, in a regular case would, would want to keep around uh, for typical functioning. Um, but if we induce uh, that knockout or, or some kind of loss of function mutation, um, there's enough redundancy in the system to account for that loss of that, uh, that important target while taking away um, a, a major leverage point for the pathogen to uh, overcome any kind of resistances and increase proliferation, increase the viability of the environment for it to, to proliferate and uh, perform pathogenesis. So um, yeah, they, they, that's why there's typically um, a... Uh, I guess like a um, criticism of susceptibility genes is like, why, why would you want to knock out uh, targets that have basic plant functions? But uh, what the evidence shows is that, you know, there's probably so much redundancy in the system or there's likely um, enough accounting in these pathways that you can perform these knockouts to a certain degree and not see that fitness cost. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.